Hi there everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. Today we're going to be going through the Section 1 or Multiple Choice paper of the 2018 Higher Biology paper. So as with the other videos, I'll be going through each question a step at a time. I will read out the question. It would be good for you to be able to pause it and attempt the question. I will then give the answer and then I'll also say why that is the answer and describe the rest of the uh, options available. Uh, if you want a copy of this paper, I'll attach a link to it below in the video notes. And as I said before, the important thing here is if you're getting the, the answers right, that's fantastic. But if you don't, it's important that you know why you're getting them incorrect. And hopefully my descriptions will help you out there. So let's get started with question one, where we'll look at the products of fermentation. So question one says the following substances are products of fermentation. One is ATP, two is lactate, and three is carbon dioxide. And the question asks, which of these products of fermentation, or uh, which of these are products of fermentation in human muscle cells? So again, just a reminder, if you want to pause the question and give this a go, I'll tell you the answer and why in a second. <clears throat> so for question one, the correct answer is B, one and two only, or ATP and lactate. So the reason for this is a net gain of 2 ATP is produced in stage 1, which is glycolysis. Remember that takes place regardless of respiration or fermentation taking place. So you have 2 ATP and there is also pyruvate that is produced in glycolysis. That pyruvate is converted to lactate through fermentation in animal cells, so for example human muscle cells. Um, carbon dioxide is only present in fermentation in plant and yeast cells. So three would not count, it would only be one and two. So the correct answer is B. For question two, there's a diagram that represents a stage of cellular respiration that occurs in a mitochondrion. So you have P that goes to the inner membrane proteins, which gives Q, and also P is, uh, is there afterwards as well, which combines with molecule R to give water. So the question here asks which row in the table identifies substances P, Q and R? So the correct answer for question two is D. P is the hydrogen ions and electrons, Q is ATP and R is oxygen. So the reason for this is that if you remember in the electron transport chain, Hydrogen ions and electrons are passed onto the electron transport chain by NAD or NADH at that point. These electrons are there to provide energy for the hydrogen ions to pass through the inner membrane proteins and then across the electron transport chain. And then these hydrogen ions are going to flow through the ATP synthase enzyme to generate ATP, which would be Q in this diagram. And then finally, after this has taken place, those hydrogen ions, so again, P, uh, and electrons are going to combine with oxygen, and they're going to combine together to form water. So R, in this case, would be oxygen. For question three, we have a metabolic pathway. It says, part of a metabolic pathway used by cells to produce the amino acid alanine is shown. Uh, so you have phosphenolpyruvate, which is converted into pyruvate through pyruvate kinase, which then gives uh, alanine later on. And it says alanine is a non-competitive feedback inhibitor of the enzyme pyruvate kinase that we see in italics uh, above this process here. The following statements refer to the metabolic pathway. One, pyruvate kinase reduces the activation energy needed to convert phosphenol pyruvate into pyruvate. Statement two says phosphenol pyruvate is the substrate for pyruvate kinase. And uh, statement three says alanine can bind to the active site of pyruvate kinase. And the questions ask you which of these statements are correct. So you go through statements one, two, and three, find out which of them are true. So the correct answer for question three is A, one and two are correct, three is incorrect. So the question states, first of all, that pyruvate kinase uh, is the enzyme, and we know that enzymes reduce the activation energy required, uh, in this case, to convert 
phosphonyl pyruvate into pyruvate. So uh, one is going to be correct. That is, that's what the point of that pyruvate kinase is. Uh, again, since we know that pyruvate kinase is an enzyme uh, and it converts phosphonyl pyruvate into pyruvate, then th this means that this phosphonyl pyruvate would be the substrate that the enzyme acts on. So two is also correct. Uh, however, the question does state that alanine is a non-competitive inhibitor. So that means that although it can bind to and inhibit the pyruvate kinase enzyme, it's not going to bind to the active site. If you remember, it would only bind to the active site if it was a competitive inhibitor. So therefore, statement three is incorrect. Question four is a graph-based question that says shrews are small mammals. Uh, the graph shows the relationship between body mass and oxygen consumption of shrews at two environmental temperatures. Uh, we can see here that the black line is 10 degrees Celsius and the dashed line is 20 degrees Celsius. And we have a change of body mass on the bottom and the measured oxygen consumption uh, up the left hand side here. The question here, and I'll try and get it so you can see most of it, uh, which of the following statements about the graph is correct? So as usual, what you need to do is go through each of the statements, A, B, C and D, and find out which one of them is true and the rest should be false. If you do come across, for example, statement A, and you think, oh, that's correct, don't just leave the rest of them. Go through the rest and make sure they are false, just in case you've made any mistakes. So uh, I will leave this here so you can see most of the question and uh, I'll go through the answer in a second. So this is quite a tricky graph that trips up a lot of people here. So first of all, um, let's go for statement A. It says shrews of greater mass consumed less oxygen. So initially when you look at this, uh, you would assume that's probably correct because you're seeing body mass increasing and you're looking at oxygen consumption and both of these graphs on a decline. However, uh, the problem with the scale is that it's actually showing oxygen consumption per centimetres cubed per gram of body mass per hour. So when we're looking at this, for example, at um, this stage here, if you look at the 20 gram of body mass and look at its oxygen consumption, that 20 gram, if you convert it, is going to be about 0 0.18, whereas it's going to be about 2.4 earlier on. So it's not so much that it consumes less oxygen, it's not just as simple as looking at the oxygen levels. For uh, statement B, the optimum temperature for oxygen consumption was 10 degrees Celsius. That is also incorrect because you can see, if you compare the two uh, lines here, two graphs, the oxygen consumption is actually lower at 20 degrees Celsius than it was at 10. Uh, C says, as environmental temperature increased, oxygen consumption decreased. So that is true because that's effectively the, the opposite of statement B. We can see that oxygen consumption is lower at 20 degrees Celsius, the higher temperature than 10 degrees Celsius. And finally, D says, at 10 degrees Celsius, a 16 gram shrew consumed a 6.2 centimeter cubed of oxygen uh, per gram of body mass per hour. So this is where you do actually need to use the scale and have a look. But if you go across and you find uh, the 16 gram shrew at 10 degrees, you'll actually find that it works out as 6.8 rather than 6.2 across here. So that is also incorrect. So the correct answer for this is C. For question five, it uh, tells us that yeast cells contain the enzyme catalase, which breaks down hydrogen peroxide to produce oxygen. An experiment was carried out into the effect of lead nitrate concentration on the activity of catalase. Six flasks were set up, each contained 25 centimetres cubed of hydrogen peroxide and 10 centimetres cubed of yeast suspension. Uh, 10 centimetres cubed of a different concentration of lead nitrate was then added to each flask. The volume of oxygen produced after 15 minutes was measured. Identify the independent variable in this experiment. So the correct answer for question five is D, the concentration of lead nitrate. So if you remember, the independent variable is what is changed in the experiment. And in this question, 
In amongst all the detail, it tells you that a different concentration of lead nitrate was added to each flask. So because that is the only variable that has been changed, they all have the same volume of hydrogen peroxide, the same volume of uh, yeast, for example, then we now know that the concentration of lead nitrate is what was changed, and that makes it the independent variable. Question six, the diagram illustrates the circulatory system of a fish. The arrows indicate the direction of blood flow. So you're seeing the heart, to the capillaries in the gills, to the capillaries in the body tissues, and back to the heart. Which row in the table describes the type of circulatory system of a fish and the blood pressure in the capillaries in the gills and body tissues? So the correct answer for question six is C. So the type of circulatory system here is single. Um, you should remember that fish have a single circulatory system uh, as opposed to the double. You can also see in the diagram that the blood goes through the heart once in each circuit. Um, the blood pressure in the gills is high and that's where the oxygen is going to enter the bloodstream. And when it gets lower at the blood tissues, that's when oxygen is passed onto the body tissues. So again, you should hopefully remember single circulatory system, high blood pressure at the gills, lower blood pressure at the body tissues. Answer C. For question seven, we have another graph. It says, in an investigation into fermentation, yeast was grown in a flask of glucose solution for 20 hours at 20 degrees Celsius. The graph shows the concentrations of ethanol and glucose in the flask over the period of this investigation. So when we're looking at this graph, we have the ethanol concentration and the black line on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we have the glucose concentration with the dashed line. What was the glucose concentration when the ethanol concentration was 3.3 grams per liter? Uh, there are options here, but you should be able to work this out just by looking at the graph itself. So the correct answer for question seven is uh, answer C. If you're looking here, that'd be 2.4 grams per liter. So the reason for this is the ethanol concentration on the left-hand side in the solid black line. Um, if we see when it was 3.3 grams, we can uh, look across here and see it was at 17.5 hours. If we then look at the, uh, down the dashed line, I look at the right hand scale, so across over here, then what we're going to find is the glucose concentration would be 2.4 if we match it across. So again, making sure that we're using the right scale for the correct um, either ethanol or glucose. So 2.4 or answer C for this question. For question eight, the following statements describe stages in the Calvin cycle or we would say carbon fixation. So the first one is that carbon dioxide attaches to RUBP to produce 3PG. The second statement is 3PG forms G3P. And the third statement is that G3P regenerates RUBP. So all stages in carbon fixation. Which one in the table identifies the stage which is catalyzed by Rubisco and the stage which requires air hydrogen? The correct answer for question eight is A, stage one is catalyzed by Rubisco and stage two requires hydrogen. So if you remember in these stages of carbon fixation, carbon dioxide is attached or fixed to RUBP by the enzyme Rubisco, which is going to produce 3PG. So that's going to be stage one. And in terms of requiring hydrogen, that 3PG forms G3P by the addition of hydrogen ions and by being phosphorylated. So that's going to be statement two. So question eight, the correct answer is A. For question nine, we have a bit of an experimental design question. So the diagram shows apparatus used in the investigation to measure the rate of photosynthesis in Elodia pondweed at different wavelengths of light. Coloured filters were used to change the wavelength of the light. The volume of oxygen collected after 30 minutes was used to measure the rate of photosynthesis. So we have our Elodie, sorry, Elodia here with our light source and the colored filters and the oxygen that's being produced is going up into this measuring cylinder with a scale for measuring the results. 
Suggested improvements to the investigation are shown. One, use a measuring cylinder with a narrower diameter. Two, repeat the experiment several times and take averages. And three, use a scale with more divisions. The question is asking you which of these suggestions, one, two, and three, would improve the accuracy of the results. So it's asking about accuracy, not anything else. <clears throat> So the correct answer for this question is B, one and three only. So when it comes to accuracy, we are looking at improving and using the appropriate equipment to measure a result, to get as accurate a result as possible. So by using a measuring cylinder with a narrower diameter than this, and by adding more divisions to a scale, this is going to be much easier to make more accurate uh, measurements of the volume of oxygen that is in that cylinder. So one and three are correct. For two, to repeat the experiment several times and take averages, that is going to make the experiment more reliable, but the question is asking about accuracy, not reliability, so be careful with that. For question 10, the diagram shows a perennial weed found in agricultural land in Scotland. It says, which feature of this weed indicates that it should be controlled by a systemic herbicide? So you can see in the diagram it's pointing towards seeds, stem, leaf and storage organ. And these are your options. So the correct answer for this is C, the storage organ. So systemic herbicides work by spreading through the entire plant system and killing everything off, especially including the storage organ, because that prevents the weed from regrowing. If you just killed off the stem or the leaf or anything like this and did not destroy the storage organ, then the whole point of having the storage organ there is that perennial weed can return. So if you're using a systemic herbicide, you want to use it on a plant with storage organs. For question 11, a field trial was carried out to investigate the effect of mass of phosphate fertilizer applied on the growth of barley. The barley was planted in plots of equal area on a hillside and fertilizer applied as shown in the diagram. So we have a hill, we have uh, 2 grams per meter squared, 4 grams per meter squared, and 6 grams per meter squared. There's three plots all in the grid. Which of the following procedures would improve the field trial design to take into account higher soil moisture levels at the bottom of the hill? The correct answer for this would be B, to randomise the treatment plots. So the reason for this is it, it mentions in the question that there's higher moisture levels at the bottom of the hill. Now, you can see the plots are not randomised. There's three sets of two, four, and six. Now, this is going to lead to biasing your sample. So, for example, in this occasion here, you could end up getting the best results at the bottom of the hill from your six gram per metre squared plots, purely because of the moisture level at the bottom of the hill. You may assume that's to do with that level of fertiliser, but it's biased because of the changes in the moisture level. However, if you go and randomise those plots, then you're going to be able to see what is best across the whole field there. So any sort of question that you have, we have to prevent bias, you have to randomise those plots. So the correct answer is B. Question 12 asks, which of the following is an example of kin selection? Um, so there's work, uh, cut, sorry, worker leaf cutter ants raising young ants in their colony, a vampire bat regurgitating blood to feed an unrelated bat, a dominant lion feeding on a zebra kill before its offspring, and a young orangutan spending a long period in parental care to learn complex social behaviours. So the correct answer for this is A. So A is an example of kid selection. Um, because the worker ants are raising related, but not their own offspring. So they are assisting with a related, uh, but it's not their own. The rest of them are not examples of kin selection. If you did go for B, vampire bat regurgitating blood to feed an unrelated bat, the whole reason of kin selection is it's to do with related organisms or individuals. So although that vampire bat is taking care of another bat, it is unrelated. So that is not an example of kin selection. For question 13, an experiment was carried out to investigate the growth rate of pigs. They were put into five groups of eight pigs, each with the same average initial body mass. 
Each group was fed a diet which contained either 0, 10%, 20%, 30% or 40% faba beans. The pigs were re-weighed re each day for 40 days. But which aspect of the experimental design increased the reliability of the results? The correct answer for 13 is D. It was each group contained eight pigs. So the reason for this is that because each group contained eight pigs, it meant that an average could be taken from each group rather than only taking a result from one pig. And as we know, having a larger data set and obtaining an average will make the results more reliable. So 13 is D. For question 14, an investigation was carried out into the social hierarchy in a group of five hens. So V, W, X, Y and Z. Hens establish dominance by pecking each other aggressively. The number of pecks given and received was recorded. The results are shown in the table. So here we're seeing the number of pecks given by each of the five hens, but also the number of pecks received by each hen as well. From this, the order of hierarchy from most dominant to least dominant hen is, and you have your options down here. So the correct answer for this is B. The order of hierarchy is uh, W, V, sorry, Y, V, W, X, and Z. So answer B. If we look at the pecking order from the table, we have Y has pecked every other hen several times in this section here which means that they are going to be the most dominant hen. Uh, after that, V has pecked the next most, followed by W, and then by X, who has only pecked hen Z. Unfortunately, Z um, has not pecked any hen at all, and it's had a really bad time receiving 30 pecks by all the other hens, so therefore Z is going to be at the bottom of this hierarchy. So 14 correct answer is B. For question 15, each type of human cell has a different structure and function because only some of their cells are, sorry, their genes are expressed. Uh, they contain different genes, some genes are lost during differentiation, or some genes are gained during differentiation. And correct which one, uh, sorry, choose which one is correct. So the correct answer is A. They have a different structure and function because only some of their genes are expressed. So if you remember, different cells express certain genes in order to produce proteins that are characteristic for that type of cell. So although cells contain uh, all genes, they are all present, only some of those genes are going to be expressed and that's going to give that cell a certain structure and a specialised function. So 15 is A. For question 16, the list describes some uses of stem cells. One, studying how cells differentiate. Two, researching the development of Parkinson's disease. Three, producing skin for skin grafts. And four, bone marrow transplants. But which of these uses are not therapeutic? So the correct answer for 16 is B, one and two only. So studying cell differentiation and researching the development of Parkinson's disease, they are both research uses of stem cells. They are not therapeutic. So they are the ones that are uh, the correct answer. They are not therapeutic uses. For three and four, they are therapeutic uses. Okay? Therapeutic uses relate to uh, healing, curing diseases. Um, so skin grafts and using bone marrow transplants are examples of these. So 16, correct answer is B. Now 17, if you come across it, um, sexual selection is no longer in the course. I'm doing this video in 2022, so don't worry if you're seeing it just now. Um, for those of you who are curious though, um, it does come up in advanced higher if you're taking it. Sexual selection is basically the selection of traits or characteristics concerned with increasing mating success of an individual. Uh, so in this case, uh, it would be D, if you're curious. The female grouse mating with a male with the best uh, display is sexual selection, whereas things like koalas having resistance to disease, surviving to reproduce, that's natural selection, which hopefully you are aware of. So again, 17, ignore that one uh, if you're keeping score just now. 
For question 18, a population of finches became isolated on an island. The graph shows the range of beak sizes within the initial population at the time of isolation and in the population after many generations. So the uh, black line in this diagram here is the initial population at the time of isolation and the dashed line that you can see that's a bit more squeezed in is the population after many generations. The question asks which row in the table shows the type of selection pressure and the type of speciation which might be expected to occur in this example. And I'll try and squeeze this in so you can see it all. The correct answer for this is C. The selection pressure is stabilising and the speciation is allopatric. So you can see in this uh, diagram here that both extremes of the phenotype, in this case beak size, they have not been selected for. Okay, So going from the initial to many generations later, we're actually seeing a move into the middle, into the average phenotype. So that average phenotype has been selected for, and as you can see, it has increased in frequency over the generations. So this would be an example of stabilising selection. Uh, the question also tells us, though, that the finch population became isolated on an island. So this is going to be an example of geographical isolation, which in turn leads to allopatric speciation. So it's a, another good example here of the amount of information that is given to you in the question itself. Almost finished now. Uh, question 19 is another old question here, so apologies for that. Um, Again, if you wanted to test yourself out, it's asking some processes involved in evolution are shown. So sexual selection that we mentioned earlier, disruptive selection and genetic drift. And it's asking which of these processes involve non-random changes in the frequency of DNA sequences. So as I've said to you, this is not in the course, so do not worry. But the correct answer here is A. And you should hopefully be able to work out anyway that any form of selection is non-random because a certain trait or a certain characteristic has been selected for. So not randomly, there is a selection taking place. And the final question for 2018 is, the analysis of DNA sequences from different organisms is used in the production of molecular clocks. This analysis is based on the assumption that over time, DNA sequences undergo mutations A, randomly, B, spontaneously, C, at a varying rate, or D at a constant rate? Now the correct answer for question 20 is D. It is assumed that in molecular clocks there is a constant rate of mutation. And uh, we've talked about this during phylogenetics because although that allows us um, to make a molecular clock and we can try and date certain amino acids, for example, assuming a constant rate of mutation could be a limitation if that mutation rate is not actually constant. So 20 is D. So hopefully you've worked through these and if you've got questions right, well done. If you've got any questions wrong, I really hope that my uh, description of my walkthrough has helped you point out where you went wrong with it. Um, again, we will try to get some more of these past paper videos done. Um, hopefully it'll be of good use to your, your vision. Uh, bye for now and I'll see you for the next video.